So we're going to uh, start the uh, final session on outcome and quality metrics. I'm uh, Amy Cobble. I'm going to be moderating this along with Dr. Linda Phillips. Um, the spe first speaker come up, please. <clears throat> the title of our first talk is uh, Expirel versus the OnQ pump, a head-to-head -head comparison in breast reconstruction by Michael Tessie and others from the University of Pennsylvania. And the discussant will be Juliana Hans Hansen. Thank you for the opportunity to present this recent work from the University of Pennsylvania. The authors have no disclosures. The, uh, the transversus abdominis pain block um, was introduced by Dr. Rafi in 2001. Uh, and in this technique, he described injecting um, in, in a plane to affect the iliac helpic asterisk, the ilio inguinal, and the um, lower intercostal nerves as they traverse the costal margin and the iliac crest. And you see here the landmarkings that he published, and uh, the, the landmark that he uses is the lumbar triangle of Petit, as you see with anatomical landmarks uh, noted there. And then, the, of course, the internal oblique muscle residing within the triangle. Uh, the, in 2011, an ultrasound guided adaptation of this technique was published. Uh, and in this case, they used rapivacaine after DIEP free flap breast reconstruction. Uh, and they reported lower morphine requirements in 0 to 24 hours and lower cumulative morphine requirements as well, again using the rapivacaine. In the same year, Expiril was released onto the market, and the, the, the drug reported decreased post-surgical pain uh, and decreased opioid use. And the, the surgeries, the, the clinical trials that supported its release included bunionectomy and hemorrhoidectomy. Orthopedic surgery was also pretty quick to, uh, to use this drug in their total knee arthroplasties, uh, and they reported mixed results uh, as, as, as time went on. Initially, uh, they, they reported exactly what the, um, the liposomal bupivacaine literature had shown in order to get it on the market, and that the, the onset of action, the optimal use for the drug, uh, the effect was the 24 to 36 hour mark. And additionally, if you've seen that lower graph there, that patients reported lower post-operative pain scores. Uh, as a couple of years went on, uh, some studies challenged uh, this, this finding in that the liposomal bupivacaine uh, actually providing inferior pain control uh, compared to the less expensive traditional bupivacaine in multimodal pr uh, pain control programs. Uh, so regarding the liposomal bupivacaine uh, and the plastic surgery literature, uh, it was uh, first introduced uh, in the submuscular breast augmentation population and then later in the implant-based reconstruction group where they took two groups, uh, and one with the use of the drug and the other without the use of the drug, uh, and they found um, with the, the pain catheters placed in a submuscular uh, plane, and they found that the liposomal bupivacaine uh, decreased patient uh, pain scores. Uh, they required less narcotic management and reduced the length of stay. The limitations for these studies that, that we just reviewed include the following, that for the abdominal wall studies, uh, they used tap blocks with rapivacaine and not liposomal bupivacaine, and that the other studies that actually used Expiril or liposomal bupivacaine in the breast was that uh, they, they used it in the breast but not in the abdominal tissues during breast reconstruction. So to date, there are no head-to-head -head comparisons of Expiril with any other modality for post-operative pain control for abdominally-based breast reconstruction, and the purpose here and for our study was to do exactly that, performed a head-to-head -head comparison of patients receiving the Expiril and receiving on-cue pain catheters in the separate group for pain control to determine what differences exist between pain control, return to ambulation, and the use of narcotic medication. Now, notably at Penn Plastic Surgery, we operate at several different hospitals. So the, the study actually came about when one of the community hospitals decided to uh, move away from using the on-cue catheters and instead used Expiril. And this left us the opportunity to perform a retrospective investigation for these differences. Uh, the two groups, the Expiril group and the OnQ group, were matched very nicely uh, in terms of their demographic. Their average age, the length of stay, and the BMI uh, showed no significant difference. They were, they were matched nicely. And the, the, the methods, as you see here, for the variables of interest, we wanted to look at PCA attempts, the number of deliveries, uh, average pain scores, the amount of narcotic pain medication, and the Braden scale for activity, which, as you'll see in the, the uh, future slides, is a, a grading from one through four on the patient's ability to ambulate. Uh, and you see there uh, listed is the inclusion and exclusion criteria. Uh, 
The technique involves injection of 120 cc's uh, both into the muscle and into uh, the subcutaneous tissues. Uh, no chest injections and no abdominal fat injections uh, occur. Uh, in this case, the, the senior author feels for the ASIS and then uh, essentially feels for a popping sensation through the fascia to know that he's in the correct plane uh, and then go, in, injects um, laterally uh, from the muscle thereon. The results that we experienced uh, include return to ambulation. Using that Braden scale, as you see there, uh, one through four, that the expiral patients uh, had a, a faster return to ambulation on post-operative day one, which as we know was when the, uh, the onset, the effect of the drug is actually at its, its peak. The uh, average daily pain scores for the group in post-operative day two through five, the expiral group had higher reported pain scores than the on-cue group. In the uh, PCA usage through post-op day zero through two. The on-cue group reported significantly higher usage of the PCA and falling in line with that is higher total PCA doses in aggregate for the two groups. The on-cue group essentially having almost double the amount of narcotic pain requirement than the expiral group in that time period of zero through two on post-operative days. The limitations of this study uh, do include the strict adherence to the Braden score uh, by the nursing staff, as there could be some variability in the number um, that, that is reported to the, to the staff and how they're recording it. The self-reported data uh, and uh, the, the pain skills being subjective uh, is also a limitation in the understanding of how the PCA works uh, with timeout and education uh, to the patient with how to properly use the PCA is also a consideration for limitation. Uh, the conclusion, you know, the, the patients receiving Expiral did require less pain control via the PCA on post-operative day one, but the advantage is short-lived. Uh, in post-op day two through five, the expiral patients did report significantly higher pain uh, levels than the on-cue users, uh, and this possibly suggests that they're in relatively less pain in the short term uh, with higher levels affecting them once the drug wears off. Uh, the expiral recipients had a higher post-operative day one score, and this possibly indicates the faster return towards baseline function. And when that happens, this leads to an earlier return and an elevated pain score the following day. Uh, what is needed uh, going forward would be a larger prospective controlled study to, uh, to further clarify the, the efficacy of pain control in autologous breast reconstruction. This, this could actually be um, utilized uh, with ERAS. So if you had an ERAS protocol and then for, for both groups and then after that for postoperative pain control was either the on-cue or the expiral and then a head-to-head -head comparison of those two. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Tetchy, for a, a nice uh, study and comparison and a nice presentation. Um, I do use tap plaques pretty routinely for any uh, abdominally based case, so I'm familiar with that. I am not able to use Expiral because we're, we don't have free access to it due to the cost, so that's going to be one of my questions for you. Um, I appreciate your attempting to do this because, as we all know, um, uh, objectively assessing post-op pain is notoriously difficult, as you described, with the subjectivity and with things like the brain scale. Certainly, nurse engagement in that can create a lot of variability. My questions for you have to do with the, the three pain modalities that you described. Starting with the PCA, you talked about uh, attempts and delivery. Um, can you comment on the, the actual delivery and whether or not that was statistically significant? Um, we know that PCAs are just a delivery device and it can be filled with any number of medications and dosed any, mm -hmm. um, in multiple different ways. Um, and the second uh, analgesia modality, your on cue pain pumps, how were they placed? Were they subcutaneous or subfascial, and was that uniform through your study? And finally, and most uh, importantly, with the Expirel. Um, you know, if you look on the Expirel website, it clearly states that it's not recommended for regional anesthesia. It also recommends a maximum dose of 20 cc's and 266 milligrams. In your study, you used 120 cc's and 1,600 milligrams for each patient. So can you com comment on off-label use uh, and safety issues? And then finally, cost. Did you guys look at the cost of Expirel? And based on your um, not uniformly positive results, uh, do you feel like it's cost effective? Okay. So um, I will try and attack each one of those uh, sequentially there, and I, hopefully and I remember. Please, remi please remind forget. me if I don't. Yeah, yeah, totally. Uh, so the, 
the, the first one uh, with the amount of narcotic used through the PCA. So all of those dosages were um, trans, uh, translated into morphine equivalent units. So that way, whether a patient was on a dilaudid PCA or a morphine PCA, it was all transferred to morphine equivalent, so that way we had an equal scaling. And that was the, the graph that you, that you saw in, in, in the, right after the um, PCA usage graph, like the one that showed the total PCA dose. So that's how, that's how that was re reported and, and made sure that we were uh, square on that. Regarding the, the, the amount of drug injected, so the, uh, the 20 cc's of the drug, which is the 266 milligrams, uh, was diluted into 120 cc's. So it is exactly what you said. You know, we're, we're fine with, with um, the, you know, the being off-label, because we weren't. We were just, we still use the same amount. We just diluted it. So that way we could achieve uh, pain control throughout the entire area we were looking to block. Um, and then, sorry. Uh, uh, yeah, it, on the website it says it's not recommended for regional use. That's what I meant for off-label. Off -label. Oh, okay, okay. Um, so for, as far as that goes, uh, we essentially used um, the, the drug laterally to, um, to, to the area, essentially. So we, it wasn't necessarily regional. It was more, it was essentially an anterior approach to a tap block. So if, if the tap, if you go through the triangle and you, you uh, try to hit the nerves through that plane, we essentially went from an, from an anterior approach and tried to hit that same plane. And then the on cue pumps, where were they placed? Oh, the on cue. So they, they're actually placed uh, intraoperative. And so we're able to ensure that the, the pain catheters reside in the proper plane and it's subfascial. So uh, while the belly is still open, uh, they're kind of fed with side ports in subfascially and then closed appropriately. And then finally, costs. Did you look at the cost? Yes, then? yes. So, so the, the expiral costs $315 uh, per vial, so per 20 cc's. The on cue pain pumps uh, cost $235. Uh, and that's even with, without the injection of the drug in the pain pump itself, which even that, uh, if my memory serves me correctly, I believe is $15 to $30, somewhere in that range. So the, the, as far as the cost, they're quite equally matched. Uh, we, for this study, didn't perform a cost analysis, a long-term cost analysis over the two groups. That's certainly something that we could look into doing, but as just looking at the raw numbers, since they looked reasonably uh, close, we, we didn't anticipate that we would see a significant difference. Did you have any malfunction of any of the on-cue pumps? Uh, no. Fortunately, in this case, there was no, no reported malfunction of any of the on-cue pumps. Are you allowed to fill them, or does the pharmacy fill them for you? No, the pharmacy you? does. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there's probably a charge from that, too. Oh, I'm, oh, I'm sure, probably. <laughs> we have a question. Hi, James Gather for the Cleveland Clinic. We're actually doing a perspective trial looking at uh, bupivacaine alone versus Expiril. Um, and we actually found something very similar to you, that on post-op day one, the bupivacaine alone was actually more effective in controlling their pain. But as the time progressed, the Expiril tended to keep their pain level more controlled. So I wonder if it's more of a function of how the medication is released in that setting versus actually their activity scale. But it sort mm -hmm. of corroborates what you've done. Very interesting. I'd love to talk to you afterwards about what you're doing. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next paper is Qualitative Assessment of Outcomes Following Ventral Hernia Repair, Implications for Clinical Research, presented by John Fisher uh, from the University of Pennsylvania, and the discussant will be Howard Levinson. Good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to share our work. These are my disclosures. I do have some research support from the National Science Foundation and internally at Penn, but I want to make a note that specifically this work was directly supported by a pilot grant from the Center for Human Appearance uh, to uh, pursue qualitative work that assesses what matters to patients after complex hernia reconstruction. And the reason why this matters is because incisional hernia is a very, very common uh, surgical disease, and as reconstructive surgeons, we're frequently called upon uh, to treat these patients. And this is data that just shows how common it is and how costly it is. I think perhaps more importantly, as it relates to the patients we treat, one in three hernias uh, will occur at seven years, and the risk of morbidity and complications is quite significant. And this directly translates into disability for patients, impaired function, the need for multiple procedures, and significant indirect as well as direct costs. 
I often think of incisional hernia in terms of this conceptual framework, and frequently these patients develop postoperative complications and recurrence, and ultimately this leads to a high risk of multiple operations. And the traditional endpoint that we consider and think about is recurrence, but is this really what matters the most to the patient? And I think that as we've learned through some of the work from Dr. Andrea Pusick, who has really pioneered patient-reported outcomes in uh, plastic surgery, we've learned that there are other things that matter to patients. And these patient-reported outcomes, which are really pieces of data taken from the patient and then not interpreted by the healthcare provider, are critically important for us to understand what the real effect of a surgical intervention is. So some of the current limitations of PROs in the literature are that they really haven't been robustly developed. And this takes a lot of time, and qualitative work has to be done to understand and define the issues that are relevant to the patients, conceptualize their meaning, and establish relationships, and really opera operationalize these relationships. And ultimately, this leads to an ability to develop a questionnaire that really considers the multiple aspects of a patient's life. So there's three basic steps, and these steps are summarized here. Uh, item generation involves creating the concepts that are important to uh, the patient and beginning with a framework, and then reducing and refining these items using cognitive interview techniques and ultimately testing uh, uh, statistically whether these uh, are the right tools and questions to be asking patients. So to do this, we collaborated at the University of Pennsylvania with qualitative researchers, and specifically Dr. Fran Barg, uh, who runs and heads the Mixed Methods Research Lab. So I just wanted to recognize them for their help. This is really a work-intensive uh, 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 area of research that, that we've learned a lot about and grown to appreciate their, their collaboration. So with that, the aim of our study was to develop a framework uh, that includes the patient perspective on abdominal hernia so that a more patient-centered instrument can ultimately be developed and tested with the hypothesis that engaging with patients and doing semi-structured interviews with patient collaboration will really allow for development of a more valid instrument. And this is our project overview, and we're really at the end of stage two here. It's just taking quite a bit of time, and we, we, we've, we've cruised through cognitive interviews in the past few weeks, and ultimately we'll do psychometric testing. This is our original conceptual framework here, and we identified a couple key domains that we thought would be important to patients as it relates to their abdominal wall health, including function, pain, and appearance. And then we took this framework and we uh, assessed whether this was valid, and we actually refined this uh, through a series uh, of telephone encounters with patients. And these methods are summarized here. They were semi-structured, concept elicitation interviews, a total of 15, and then a series of focus groups, ultimately allowing us to create and identify key themes that matter to patients and create a series of questions or instruments that we can use in clinical practice to understand how good of a job we are doing in taking care of our patients. So the patients were identified uh, over an eight-year period, uh, one of five surgeons, um, and uh, the relevant surgical histories and medical data was collected and abstracted. And we really sought to identify uh, uh, a spectrum of patients, uh, complex in nature, and also we recruited on a rolling basis to really maximize subject variation to uh, capture the whole uh, uh, spectrum of complex hernia. And patients were contacted via mail and telephone uh, encounters were performed. Uh, these semi-structured interviews took at least 41 minutes. So the concept elicitation and the generation of these transcripts was very, very work intensive. Uh, they ended up being de-identified and then subject to analysis using in vivo, which allowed us to extract themes from thousands and thousands of words and create items for our tool. Ultimately, the focus groups were then used to refine these concepts and ideas to create an instrument. And this is a summary of those stages. Um, the concept elicitation phase, our two focus groups, which were performed in June as well as August of this past year, and ultimately the first set of cognitive interviews that we performed. And this is a snapshot summary of the 15 patients who underwent uh, concept elicitation interviews with our mixed methods team. And these patients, as you can see, are complex. They're obese. They've had multiple hernias. And this is a, a very difficult group of patients. And their data was extracted and transcribed and ultimately used as the substrate for a series of focus groups to create our instrument. And these focus groups had uh, several different purposes. Uh, the outcome of the first focus group was really the refinement of the tool and focused on uh, relating uh, physical body characteristics. And the second focus group allowed us to revise our original framework and led to the development of a seven domain new framework and our initial tool, which I will share with you in a moment. This is what happened in the focus group, uh, and this is just data uh, from the first focus group and really the preliminary feedback from our initial uh, conceptual model. And this is more of that data. 
Ultimately, as I mentioned, the second focus group involved revising the framework and ranking uh, the different uh, items as summarized here, uh, ultimately to create the instrument. And this is what our, our, our final result was in terms of a conceptual framework. And, and this, I think, in many ways nicely represents the 360-degree uh, understanding of the, of the complex hernia patient's perspective. And I think it captures key things like quality of life, uh, psychosocial domains, appearance, which we found to be a very, very important underreported aspect of, uh, of what people are thinking about. And I think that not surprisingly, expectations do drive how patients perceive their results, and really the patient physician relationship matters critically. So as we're moving through this project, cognitive interviews are ongoing and the tools being refined. And, and this is a snapshot of, of some of the elements of this tool. We have a 37 item tool that takes approximately 10 minutes to complete, which is, which is good. Um, and the questions uh, per our first cognitive interview have been easy to understand and the instrument is noted to be clear and comprehensive. And these are the types of questions that we're gonna be integrating uh, into our instrument. So to conclude, our goal was to explore using qualitative techniques, the patient perspective in complex hernia, and to try to integrate this into a conceptual framework so that we can do a better job ultimately in identifying what matters to patients. We really uh, truly discovered some uh, in, uh, increased variability in the patient uh, perception of their result after hernia repair. And we identified some interesting and new themes and seven different domains that should be included uh, in a patient reported outcome measure. And our future directions, as I mentioned previously, will focus on refining this instrument and then ultimately validating it. Thank you for the opportunity to share this work. John, I want to congratulate you on your work. As, as you point out, developing these tools is complicated and requires a multidisciplinary team. So, so congratulations on achieving you know, your goal. Um, I think there are three questions that come to mind when you talk about patient reported outcomes. So the, the first question I wanted to ask you is, why did you seek to develop this tool? Like, What was the impetus in your practice um, to do this? And, and how does this fit in the context of other tools for hernia repair? Um, the second thing is, so this is probably going to require another three to five years, as your point pointed out, to validate and get completed. So um, for the rest of the audience members who are fixing hernias today, how are we going to benefit from this tool? Like, like how am I going to use this in my practice, and what's the value add for, for me as a practitioner and a hernia surgeon? The third thing I wanted to ask you about was you pointed out Andrea's work with the patient reported outcomes. and. Um, that she has tools for different diseases, and now you've developed a tool for hernia, but it's a labor-intensive process. But if you follow that train of thought, there's a lot of different diseases we treat as hernia, as uh, plastic surgeons. And so which tools should we be developing for which diseases? Like, where do we begin, and when do we end? Thank you. Thanks so much for uh, your comments and questions, Dr. Levinson. So I'll address these uh, three questions in sequence. So I think that the, the first question was, was wh why do this? And I think that I have a personal and clinical interest in, in, in treating complex hernia, and it's something I do on a routine basis. I use two instruments uh, in practice, pre- and post-operatively. One is the Hercules, uh, and one is the Carolina Comfort Scale. And when you give these surveys to patients, they don't really fit or make sense. So I kind of identified a clinical need uh, to develop a better instrument that really captures what matters to the patients, because uh, the Hercules tool was developed by just a seven-surgeon consensus with no patient input, and that really inherently means it lacks content validity. It's not really derived from from patient level data. And the Carolina Comfort Scale is, is a, is a, is a long-established tool that's able to assess how patients feel after hernia repair, but, but it's very mesh-centric and difficult to understand, and it's kind of a, a cumbersome tool. Um, and I think the other option um, is, is a generic instrument, like the SF12, which I don't think will adequately capture the disease-specific nature uh, of complex hernia. So I, I think that there was a clinical need to do this. And that kind of leads into how will this change practice and how can this be used. I think in a couple ways this can be used. I think it can allow us to better communicate with our patients to understand what matters to them. I think that it will also be a very interesting way to look at 
pre and post operatively, are we doing a good job? And in looking at are we doing a good job in a different dimension, not just a clinical outcome, a dimension that really matters more to the patients. And down the road, we may be, you know, we may be accountable for having this type of data to get compensated uh, and paid. And I think it, it really is the right thing to do, and I, I think it matters. So what I would envision would be that this instrument would be embedded in the EHR or that it would be, you know, mailed to the patient uh, or emailed to the patient, and the patient could uh, track and measure their patient portal outcomes over time, and we could keep an eye on how the patient is doing socially and really do a better job taking care of patients and understanding what matters to them. And then to answer your last question, which is a really, really interesting question about should there be instruments for every single surgery that we do, I think the short answer is no, there shouldn't be. But you know, seeing what Dr. Pusick has done is it's truly inspirational. And to have an instrument for, for breast cancer treatment or for breast or for face, I think is great. But ultimately, we can't have an instrument for every single uh, 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 disease that we treat. And I think that you know, hernia is unique, and I think that there's a need for one, and that's why we pursued this. But certainly, generic instruments have significant value, such as the SF12 or 36, and that probably should be used uh, in lieu of, uh, of of, of just creating a new instrument for, for every surgical procedure because, as you pointed out and as I've learned through this, it is a time-intensive uh, <laughs> endeavor. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. The next paper is Free Tissue Transfers for Head and Neck Cancer Patients with End-Stage Renal Disease on Dialysis. Analysis of Outcomes Using the Taiwan's National Health Insurance Research Database by Oscar Manrique and others from the Mayo Clinic, China Medical University Hospital, and the discussant will be Perong Yu. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Oscar Manrique. I'm from Mayo Clinic. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the uh, association for allowing us to present uh, our data this afternoon. Our group has no disclosures. So patients with end-stage renal disease have been increasing at around 5% every year. Uh, a lot of these patients uh, will require uh, free tissue transfer during their lifespan due to trauma and uh, most likely from cancer. It's been already well reported that patients with end-stage renal disease have high comorbidities such as uremia, diabetes, or severe atherosclerotic disease that can compromise all the reconstructed efforts. Having this as background, the purpose of our study were to, was to look at the outcomes of end-stage renal disease patients under dialysis who underwent free tissue transfers for head and neck reconstruction. This study was based on the Taiwan National Health Insurance Program database that uh, <clears throat> gathers close to 99% of the Taiwanese population. By the time that the study was uh, collected in 2010, there was close to 23.2 million uh, people. From here, we took two cohorts, one a group with end-stage renal disease on dialysis who underwent free tissue transfers for head and neck, and the other one with uh, non-end-stage renal disease. Based on these groups, we looked at post-op complications within 90 days of surgery and a mortality uh, within 30 days of surgery. For coexisting comorbidities, uh, we determined the presence of diabetes mellitus and peripheral vascular disease. In this 12-year period from 1998 to 2010, we ended up finding 85 patients with end-stage renal disease on dialysis when they went free tissue transfer for head and neck reconstruction. As you can see, most of them were less than 65, and the majority were men. Regarding the uh, type of cancer and subdivisions, the most common were uh, other on specified parts of the mouth, followed by tongue, gums, hypopharynx, and floor of the mouth. On table one, summarize these uh, important uh, points that I mentioned regarding the age, the gender, and the most common type of cancer in this population. Now, when we compare the non-end-stage renal disease patients with end-stage renal disease, we ended up seeing that these patients had a significantly higher rates of diabetes and peripheral vascular disease. In addition, we ended up seeing an increased risk of stroke within 90 days of surgery and a significant increase in mortality within 30 days of surgery. However, despite uh, all these complications, there is no significant difference regarding uh, flat failure among both of the groups. In addition to these findings, we also looked at other potential complications such as PE, 
pneumonia, flap loss, sepsis, acute MI and deep wound infection, and as you can see, compared within our groups, there is no significant difference. However, as I mentioned before, stroke and 30-day mortality were higher in the end-stage renal disease population. Now, looking at the overall ICU and hospital length of stay, the patients, uh, there were no significant difference uh, within the ICU length of stay among our groups. However, the overall length of stay at the hospital was higher in the end-stage renal disease group. And we extrapolate that to uh, medical expenditures and costs. They were also significantly higher in the end-stage um, renal disease uh, population. Here in the table three, we summarize also the main concepts of one higher length of stay and the higher cost for the end-stage renal disease group. So in conclusion, despite greater pre-op risk factors, this data demonstrate that renal failure patients on dialysis do not appear to be a significant uh, uh, effect for free flap survival. However, and based on these 12 years of data, we believe that optimizing patients' medical condition is critical to the success of this reconstructed effort. I want to thank all the co-authors for all their support and happy to take uh, any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Memricky, for this excellent uh, study and uh, wonderful presentation. Uh, I have a couple of comments. Uh, in, uh, and I was a little surprised to see that this patient population in your study did not have increased risk of uh, uh, perioperative myocardial infarction. Uh, we, we see a lot in, for them, vascular surgery in our early days of training. Uh, in our place, uh, uh, the, our medical team would clear everybody for surgery, even if they're dying. Uh, I realize that in some Asian countries, uh, it's much less aggressive. Is it possible that uh, many patients with uh, end-stage renal disease and a history of cardiac events actually did not go to surgery just because of the kind of cultural differences? And so your data, database didn't capture this population. My second comment is uh, related to the flap choices. Uh, as you know, these patients, they probably have uh, AV fistulas in the arms, so your, your forearm flap is out. In peripheral vascular disease, your fibular flap may be out. And you didn't show the types of defects, in particular, the types of flaps you used for this uh, uh, reconstruction. I wonder if we have any uh, look at this and uh, have any comments on that. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Yu, thank you so much for your questions. Uh, both of them are really great. Um, so the first one regarding those risk factors, yes, I think that uh, this is, has something not to be proved, but um, when I, during my fellowship there in Taiwan, I saw that a lot of these patients, even from prolonged surgeries, they don't get DVT or sometimes um, and or use like any heparin prophylaxis just as a separate point. Um, that was one of the limitations of our study because we were also surprised as people with severe atherosclerotic disease, and there is no significant difference uh, among. Uh, MI or myocardial infarction, because we thought that, you know, within 30 or, you know, 60 days of surgery, I think that that would probably be one of the most common causes. But um, one of the limitations of the study was that we were not able to find exactly the cause of death of these patients, which would be really interesting to see. Um, and we believe it could be multifactorial since these patients are uh, really sick and their profiles are, you know, um, complicated. And uh, regarding the second question about what type of flaps, um, that unfortunately due to the, uh, the way that the, um, the database is set up, it only is reported as free flap, but doesn't say specifically what type of flap was it done, which I agree with you. Let's say, for example, someone who already had AB fistulas in their forearms and stuff, or depending on the size of defect, of course, you know, it would be a different flap used. But yeah, that's another uh, limitation of the study, unfortunately. It only categorizes uh, with their codes as free flap or free tissue transfer, but it doesn't tell you what type of flap was used, which would be really interesting to know. Have you um, changed, or based, based on your data, would you change your workup in any way for these patients? Uh, do they need carotid ultrasounds, or is there anything you can do? That's a great question, too. Um, actually, I looked at some of the data that reported that not only due to um, the type of cancer, but a lot of these patients receive radiation as a neoadjuvant therapy. Uh, 
And there have been already reports uh, in annals of surgery in which there's an increased rate of carotid stenosis for these patients. But currently, there are no guidelines that, um, that say if these patients would benefit. Now, with this data, I think that it kind of makes sense that if these patients with anterior renal disease are going to go free transfer for head and neck, probably get a carotid ultrasound before surgery. And not only that, but I think that also even a cardiac echo, could we still don't know the sources of the stroke. It could be from manipulation close to the neck or from the heart. So I think that's a great uh, thing. Right now, currently, this paper is under revision, and that was part of our comments that we should probably work as a guideline to get these patients appropriate workup before surgery. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> the final paper, long-term assessment of Pierre Robin sequence patients treated with a vertically oriented mandibular distraction vector by Michael Lipka and others from Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City. The discussant will be Stephen Bernard. Um, thanks Thank for the you. opportunity to present, and thanks for sticking around for this last presentation. Hopefully, I don't disappoint you. Um, so Pierre Roban sequence, or Roban sequence, is the triad of glossoptosis, retrognathia, and respiratory distress. And most of these patients do have cleft palate. Peter Randall said the infant can literally exhaust himself to death unless the obstruction is relieved. So there's many classical treatments, prone positioning, supplemental oxygen, nasopharyngeal airway, tongue lip adhesion, and tracheostomy. And these are all still appropriate in certain cases. Um, tongue lip adhesion is still very popular. Tracheostomy may be uh, the preferred choice in certain situations, but we're really trying to avoid tracheostomy. There's increased costs and burden with the family. So distraction osteogenesis has largely been the preferred technique at most institutions now for moderate to severe obstructive sleep apnea in the neonate. So if you move the mandible forward slowly, you can increase the posterior airway space resolving the obstruction. This would be an example of a patient with Nager syndrome who had mandibular distraction to relieve his airway obstruction. But uh, mandibular distraction is a complex procedure and there's multiple complications associated with it. Dental injuries, nerve injuries to the facial nerve or inferior alveolar nerve, there can be device failure. A bad complication is TMJ ankylosis, which is a, a big problem if it occurs. Um, failure of the procedure, infection seems to be a relatively common complication. We don't really know what the long-term growth of these patients are. And there's a variety of techniques for mandibular distraction. It seems like most of the patients in complication studies have been grouped into this one homogeneous group, but there's many different ways of distracting the mandible. You can use internal devices, external devices. There's different vectors that can be used, vertical or horizontal vectors. The osteotomy in the mandible is different. Some use an inverted L or a stair-step osteotomy in the ramus. Some people make an osteotomy right through the body. So depending on what you do, this would change your complication rate. With respect to vector, uh, you can use a vertical vector or more of a horizontal or oblique vector. It's unclear which is the, the best way to go about it. Uh, a classic paper by McCarthy suggested that probably a vertical vector might be better. You get this improved translation of the symphysis forward. So this is, was popular, I think, early on in doing mandibular distraction. So we have a variety of techniques and really very few papers relating the type of technique to outcome. And there's really few long-term data of the patients. Uh, my predecessor at Children's Mercy Hospital did quite a few mandibular distractions, and they were all done with internal devices with a vertical vector of distraction. And I'm seeing a lot of them now. We have quite a large group of patients now in their teen years um, that we see in clinic now. So our goal here was to perform a long-term morphological assessment of Roban sequence patients who underwent neonatal mandibular distraction via a vertically oriented ramus distraction vector. So it was a retrospective IRB-approved study. Roban sequence were, patients were reviewed who had undergone mandibular distraction via this technique and had available imaging. Outcomes were looking at mandibular morphology, the patient aesthetics, occlusion, and, and some of the complications. So there were 97 patients from 2000 to present. 56 had undergone distraction via a vertical vector. We excluded patients who were syndromic who didn't have adequate imaging, inadequate records, and had, who had inadequate follow-up. Follow All these patients were older than five years. So we ended up with 17 patients, the oldest patient being 19 years of age. 
So the analysis, we did a rated graphic analysis using Dolphin software, facial and occlusal analysis, and we reviewed some of the complications. The radiographic analysis I'll just quickly review. Um, we used SNA, that, that relates the maxilla to the cranial base. SNB, which would relate the mandible length to the cranial base. And then a relationship of the maxilla to the mandible being the A and B angle. We looked at the mandibular plane angle and the gonial angle. Then we also measured the ramus length and body length. Now remember, a lot of these patients were of different ages, so they were compared to age match um, norms. So this is uh, some of the results of the data. And again, this is simplified to, uh, to make it simpler to look at. But consistently, all the patients had a deficient maxilla, had a deficient mandible. Now, relative to one another, the maxilla and mandible were spared. The, the A and B angle was fairly normal. So when you look at, I'll show you some pictures of patients of their occlusion. It, it's actually more of a class one type occlusion, which is somewhat uh, confusing. The mandibular plane angle was high. These are all very high angle patients. And interestingly, the ramus length um, and body length, they were all shorter than controls. So let me show you some pictures of the typical patient. We see this is an 11 year old patient. Again, look at her profile. She has a convex profile. She definitely looks mandibular deficient. You see this vertical growth pattern. And you look at her occlusion, it's relatively spared. Class one, an orthodontist gets a hold of this patient. They'd say, I can treat that patient fine. But clearly, they have maxillary and mandibular deficiency. Um, here are some other patients. This is a 17-year-old patient who will be having jaw surgery uh, next year. You can see, again, this convex profile. She's had orthodontics done previously with a relatively spared uh, occlusion. This is another patient, again, convex profile, spared occlusion. So we see the same thing consistently. Some of the complications, three of the 17 patients developed TMJ ankylosis. Two, this was after the first procedure, and one of them had ankylosis after a second distraction procedure because of recurrent obstruction. There were no dental injuries, which is, would be expected. This is a ramus osteotomy, staying away from the teeth. Uh, there were some facial nerve uh, weaknesses. So this is a patient with TMJ ankylosis. He underwent a neonatal distraction and then had a distraction later on when he was about 12 years of age and was ankylosed shortly after that. He probably already had early signs of ankylosis before the second operation. This is his mouth opening. And you can see the condyle's just been, it's really rammed into the base of the skull here. You can see that. And this is his, uh, his CT scan. You see what appears to be a lengthened ramus. In fact, the ramus is actually not long. The sigmoid notch has just been blunted here. Again, this vertical growth pattern. Same with this patient, bilateral TMJ ankylosis. And a younger patient after one distraction with uh, unilateral ankylosis. So the vertical vector of distraction was uh, a champion really by McCarthy. I know uh, some people still use it. And uh, um, in general, a horizontal versus a vertical vector can uh, lead to uh, reasonable airway uh, volume increases. But in the Piero band sequence patient, typically the body is short, not the, not the ramus. And I think that McCarthy paper was really referring to more the syndromic patient, like a Treacher Collins patient, where the, the ramus is vertically short. And this concept of catch-up growth, I think it's been largely debunked that the Piero band sequence patient really does not have any catch-up growth. They have abnormal growth. This longitudinal study from sick kids in Toronto shows that uh, the maxilla and mandible is deficient. They have a vertical growth pattern similar to what we're seeing in our patients. The difference is those were unoperated patients. These are patients who've had a vertical vector of distraction. And interesting, they still have the same morphology. So why is that? Perhaps you have some unwielding nature of the pterygomasoteric sling causing relapse and uh, um, shortening of the, of the condyle. So in conclusion, we certainly have some limitations to the study being the retrospective nature and some selection bias. But consistently, the vertically distracted ramus patients are bimaxillary retrusive. They have a high angle. They have poor pagonial projection. Their occlusion's relatively spared. Uh, and there's some concern for TMJ ankylosis, especially patients treated a second time with the same technique. Thank you very much.
I will uh, serve as the discussion. I'm the default discussion uh, for this uh, paper. Um, so before I actually I address uh, the questions to, uh, to your presentations, it has been a great uh, day in the last couple of days, a great sessions, and then uh, thank you for everyone staying until the latest part of the day. And so this is, these are my questions. So um, certainly I would like to con congratulate your team uh, between you and uh, Dr. Goldstein in uh, certainly making the initiative in measuring uh, the long-term outcome in this mandibular distractions in Eurobin uh, patients. Uh, what, what kind of criteria when you decide when to distract, um, have you, how long do you try like positioning test changes and feeding difficulty or occlusion abnormality associated before you making decision. These are the right patients that we think we can help with uh, distractions. And um, you mentioned that the proportions uh, of that 56 patients out of 97 are under, uh, underwent the vertical distractions. What could you think like, could they be helped with the horizontal? What are the, the criteria and strategy development these are the patients going to be helpful with the vertical distraction or horizontal distractions. So, so far, what kind of quality improvement that we can achieve for the future in making strategy um, adjustment uh, for these kind of patients? Thank you. Well, at our institution, the, the decision to distract is a multidisciplinary uh, approach involving ENT doctors, the geneticist, uh, pediatric pulmonologists, and really it's only the most severe cases that really will have will go on to distraction. These patients get a preoperative sleep study in, mo in almost all cases unless they've had respiratory failure due to, uh, uh, and they're intubated already. So uh, these are the most severe cases that are typically distracted in, in general. Um, your question about whether to use a vertical or horizontal vector, I think it, it, it's kind of largely a, uh, uh, based on your training. So the, the previous surgeon who was at the hospital very much did this technique and would continue to do the same thing over if there was a repeat distraction. I was trained more with a horizontal or oblique vector. Um, I think the, the results comparing the two with respect to airway volume are pretty similar. Um, my concern with this vertical technique is that I'm seeing some of these patients with uh, with this ankylosis, and, and I think it's related to possibly the, you know, the vector. You're really compressing that condyle against the base of the skull, which for me can be problematic. And I think a lot of patients maybe can adapt to that, that force, but some people just won't be able to. Dr. Uh, Zins. Jim Zins from Cleveland. Uh, it's a very interesting uh, paper. Um, we don't know the N. Uh, how about functional result? Uh, how many of these patients uh, did you avoid tracheostomy? Uh, what was the functional results of your vertical, uh, your vertical correction? Uh, one, clearly they all had facial form deformity, but again, this is done, this is done very sure. to, to, to avoid tracheostomy, uh, et cetera. So it's interesting. Yeah, and this, this is difficult to, uh, certainly clinically, after th these patients had the distraction as a neonate, they all had resolution of their obstruction. What's a little bit problematic, previously, early on, preoperative sleep studies weren't done. Um, it was really based on more clinical, clinical means, so it's difficult to uh, be nice to have sleep studies before and after to really show that. Unfortunately, we don't really have that data in these early on patients. Dr. Lalikos. Thank you. Um, I just want to sort of, you know, I just want to applaud you for, for doing this and trying, you know, this is, this type of data is really, really needed, um, as you know, um, whether, whatever technique it is, just long-term data looking at all of these outcomes, because what we know now is that, you know, this is a morbid procedure and we're trying to avoid a more morbid procedure. So a long-term assessment of, of relative risk is really important. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. On behalf of the Dr. Zins, uh, the presidents uh, of this uh, year, as well as the Dr. Bernard and me, thank, thank you very much for everyone's contributions to the papers.